limited to one-fifth of the world's surface, has challenged the sea since its time on Earth began. It has been a highway, a hiding place, a battlefield and a graveyard, a place of beauty and peace, and a place of ugliness and danger. In this new age, man has designed an atomic weapon that will operate beneath the ocean's surface. Other naval weapons, carriers, cruisers, and battleships, they slug it out in the open, while still others use the skies above the water as their battlefield. This is the story of the United States Navy's Sea Dart, the world's first supersonic water-based interceptor, designed and built to fly and fight beyond the speed of sound, designed to operate on its own special runway, four-fifths of the world. The story begins in the summer of 1946, a time of importance in aviation history. During this year, a jet plane flew from Long Beach to New York in four hours and a new world's record. Also in 1946, the first jet fighter in naval history landed on a carrier's deck at sea. And at San Diego, California, engineers took the first step toward the development of a jet aircraft that could land and take off on water. From their drawing boards came the initial plan. But like all new ideas, acceptance did not come easily. There were those who said jet aircraft could not operate on water. Landing speeds would be too great. Too much drag on takeoff. Too much shock on landing. Spray would drown jet engines. These men took all these problems in stride and came up with a plausible design. But it was all on paper. program sparked by research engineers dedicated to this dream on paper moved into the model stage. Routine. Balsa wood instead of aluminum spars. Cloth skin, not stainless steel. Five thousand dollars, not a half a million. This model, one-tenth true scale in weight, length, and span, was called the skate. Its performances under simulated flight conditions would furnish the information needed to do the impossible opening up new fields in hydrodynamics and jet aircraft construction. The testing phase was routine but intense. To an outsider, the program might look like men at play. And in a way, the outsider would be right because the excitement was there, two solid years of it. But this was no game. Each launching was preceded by hundreds of pages of calculations and estimates and each launching meant revisions and corrections. data in hydrodynamics, spray studies, and stall characteristics were evaluated, reduced, and added to the growing story. Two solid years of changes, each change in design bringing the aircraft closer to perfection. All of the airplanes represented by these one-tenth scale models would work, but the model that was selected would have to be perfect and these men couldn't draw straws. Engines were added for flight evaluation, taxi performance. 
Small one-tube radios were installed in the models to give the engineers remote control, and structural changes were made to keep the models true scale and weight, and the testing went on. Each run made under different trim, attitude, and speed. Finally, after two years, tons of blueprints and thousands of hours of work, a model was selected that met all the requirements. Tests were conducted on a proposed method of carrying and launching this aircraft. But while these tests went on, an event took place at Muroc, California, that foretold the doom of the skate. A land-based fighter made its first flight. This airplane, a supersonic interceptor, had several radical improvements in airplane design, foremost of which was the triangular or delta wing. Supersonic flight was routine. Although the engineers decided to use the delta wing, discarding the swept wing of the skate, not designed for supersonic flight, the vast store of information proved valuable in the development of the supersonic sea dart. It was revolutionary in design. Hydro skis developed by the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics were coupled with the delta wing, and this combination was compatible from the start. Here, in news photos of the first tests at NACA, the model was launched under carefully controlled conditions, and the hydro-ski delta wing concept was found to be practical. Again, the hydro engineers were called upon to come up with the answers. They had help this time. The old skate had cleared away a lot of timber and the men were moving down a well-beaten path. There were a few pitfalls, and they had to be bridged. And here, in a model small enough to be picked up in a man's hands, lay the answers. What happens to a 20,000-pound airplane when it hits the water at 100 miles an hour? How can a pilot control the powerful thrust of jet engines on a liquid runway? How would it respond in flight? And what about spray damaging jet engines? These questions had to be answered, and the model was the sounding board. Testing went on, years of it. Emphasis shifted to hydrodynamics as new ski designs were tried, tested, and modified. Testing was rigorous. Different types of skis were mounted on a skeletal frame called a pantograph. Delicate and sensitive, each shock absorbed by the ski was pulsed back on electric fingers to be recorded for future reference. Carried by a powerful speedboat crammed with electronic gear, the engineers recorded ski penetration, planing angles, friction, and the many other unknown factors related to this problem in hydrodynamics. This was followed by the full-scale markup phase. And finally, production was started on the prototype. More paperwork, more planning. And the Delta configuration began to take shape. And there are aluminum spars now, not balsa wood. Stainless steel instead of fabric. No more scale model engines, but the real thing. J-34 power plants capable of 8,000 pounds thrust. A complex electronic nervous system, not a small one-tube radio.
Transforming a dream on paper into reality, everything must be perfect. This is where know-how pays dividends. An airplane skillfully assembled in a hurry-up program quietly tempered by more than 20 years' experience in the construction of water-based aircraft. In December of 1952, under the cover of darkness, the research airplane was moved from its restricted area to a hangar a few feet from San Diego Bay. The giant was about to awaken. experiences on earth which can equal the things crowding in on a test flight staff or the designers of a new airplane at a moment such as this. The lump is there in the throat, the anxieties slowly rise to an almost uncontrollable pitch, but there's nothing more that people on shore can do. No more time for another check. No more time for one last adjustment. This is the payoff. Here, for the first time in history, a supersonic seaplane met the water runway from which it was designed to operate. And as the sea dart moved away from shore, the hopes and the dreams of the engineers and craftsmen who made this moment possible rested in the hands of one man, the test pilot, whose mission it was to ride herd on the new airplane, give it treatment it would seldom get an actual use, take it to the breaking point, ring it out. Early testing was confined to San Diego Bay, the proving ground for other radical seaplanes. This plane was completely new. Her performance could not be predicted by comparing her with earlier designs. Except for one-tenth scale model, she was the first. And it was the pilot's job to ring her out. There were many items to be considered. Taxi performance, vibration, stability, and the use of the water rudder, four-body spray rail, breaker strip, skeg, new names for new equipment. Only the pilot could tell if the instruments and switches were within easy reach. Only the pilot could tell if the ship would feel right to the Navy pilots who would be flying her. And on the taxi runs, the ship seemed to strain to rise into the air. But the pilot had to complete the checkout list before the go-ahead to take her up. of April 1953, the Sea Dart moved into position for takeoff.
a pretty sight to the people below, but there was more work to do. The flight test program was moved to the open sea, five miles off the Southern California coast. In the weeks that followed, many design improvements were made until one major problem remained. Pilot reports indicated the twin ski undercarriage could be improved. The engineers then decided to incorporate a single ski arrangement on the research airplane. of this design were obvious. The single ski provided improved takeoff performance, lower airplane weight, less vibration. The pilots liked her, her new engines kicking out 10,000 pounds of thrust, riding the water like a bobsled. Clean, deadly, fast. Fast enough to leave her sound behind her and built to take it. Navy's Sea Dart. To be carried in man's new atomic weapon. To be carried undetected and to be launched with surprise against any aggressor from any ocean on Earth. To be launched from an unseen base without fear of retaliation. And in the role of a highly versatile interceptor, the sea dart can scramble in all directions from lakes, rivers, reservoirs, or bays. Full squadrons can be airborne within seconds and respond as a unit in an answer to a red alert. The sea dart. Who can name her designer? He is legion. He is an organization of 1,000 engineers and 15,000 craftsmen. Who alone can tell the story of the struggle, the disappointments, and the final triumph when the impossible took to the water and lifted off into the pages of aeronautical history? Mm -hmm. 